information or sometimes even lies and cheats which then prevents the task of what the leader took on to be accomplished so the key point we keep making is the relationship has to be an open trusting relationship first and then someone with a better idea has a chance of communicating it accurately and getting good feedback, whether it makes sense or not, and whether people will actually want to support it and do it. So that's that's point one. That, that's helpful. Ed, can you and hear me? And that leads Ed? in a way to what we mean by level two relationships, and there was a question about are there other levels. Can you hear me, Ed? Level minus no. one okay. is pure domination, where someone with more power says, you know, I'm the boss, you will do whatever I tell you to do. The prison, the prison guard, the POW, those are level minus one relationships. Level one is the transactional relationship in which the roles are defined to work together, but the people in those roles are not necessarily motivated 
to, to do what the roles require. That's what I was just saying. The subordinate may not want to do what the leader's vision is, even though the leader tries to be very articulate because they have only a transactional relationship. Level two means that leader takes the trouble or the group, if it's a group that is trying to get some work done, takes the trouble to say, let's get to know each other a little bit better in relation to the job that we're trying to do. So they take some time to analyze their group process and see who is good at what, uh, who has ideas that pertain to the particular task, and in that process, build both openness and trust. And only when they have built a certain level of openness and trust are they really ready to say, okay, what shall we do? And at that point, it's not always clear who will have the best ideas and therefore who will find themselves in the leadership position. So in a level two well-functioning group, leadership may rotate according to the requirements of the task. Now, a number of people said, do you always need, need that? Not if the task is so bell clear that someone who has the answer can announce it and everyone follows. But the reason we wrote this book is because we see that the world is no longer providing clear tasks of that sort. The tasks are getting too complicated for individuals to have that kind of uh, vision, uh, missionary sense, and ability to, to sell it. So, so that goes Ed, to the levels me? relationship. Ed, can you hear uh, me? Do you want me to, to stop for a minute? Sure. Can you hear what I'm saying? It's Linnea. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, keep going, and I'll tell you if I'm no longer hearing. Great, great. Just th this about this and uh, position. Our power does not necessarily come from our position, is part of what I'm understanding from you, and that it is an earned right and that leadership can emerge from anywhere around the best idea related to the task at hand. Is this part of what you're saying? That is exactly right. And the, the dilemma, of course, is that people who are put into the position assume that therefore they have to have the answers and therefore they don't take the trouble or make themselves vulnerable to seek the answers or to seek help from others. This will be a major problem in organizations that the boss who has the position doesn't realize that he doesn't know or she doesn't know enough and therefore will have to seek help. Therefore, humble leadership because we have humble to accept leadership it. leadership describes that situation, yes. Great, thank you. Yeah, please continue with the question. So how do we measure the effectiveness of relationships in groups and sociotech systems? Well, the, the easiest way to find out whether you've got a good level two relationship is to ask a subordinate in a hierarchy uh, when the boss asks you how things are going do you tell her or him the truth? And you'll find that in most organizations that we've encountered, the subordinates will say, well, probably not, because it's not safe to, particularly if it's negative information. Uh, the boss will get mad at me. They'll shoot the messenger. Uh, they'll, uh, they'll accept me as a whistleblower and then dead end my career. So the forces against an effective level two culture are very deep in the traditional culture. And my test of are you getting someplace is the degree to which people say, yes, I, I do feel we tell each other the truth and we can really trust each other. 
that's what I would look for. Great, and, and that would be led by the person in the senior position in a way because they have to model the humility to and the ability to not know, to not know all the answers and to share the vulnerability. So you're saying that that actually is a strength. It actually helps the organization perform better when the leader stands and says and claims, I cannot do this alone. I think that is absolutely the correct ideal. Is it practical? Is it going to happen tomorrow? Only when that leader, I think that person, actually faces a task to which they realize they don't have the answer. I think the boss has to experience, oh my God, I don't know the answer, and, and recognize that moment of truth. Because I think the system now encourages people in those positions to invent an answer because it's such a force to have an answer if you're the boss. So how we get people in CEO positions to open their mind to say, possibly, I don't have the best answer. Possibly, I need some help. That's, I think, the really tricky part of the how-to that comes up in a lot of the questions of how do we get this instituted in a, in a very tall uh, power hierarchy where subordinates want answers. They want the boss to know to the point where the boss will feel she has to produce an answer so as not to disappoint her subordinates. So the greater the power distance, the harder this becomes. And yet, it's going to be necessary. Yes, yes. And, and if I may, just the more stable an organization has been, and the longer it's been around, this becomes more challenging because they're used to very traditional ways of operating. And, for instance, I'm working with Philip Morris. Anybody know about Philip Morris and the new business strategy that they've put in place? They have committed to a smoke free future. That wow. is truly unheard of. And you can imagine that they are doing a data-driven process to move themselves, but culturally, because they see that if they're moving into the digital er arena, they've got to shift their culture. It is, and that means every single leader at the top, and that is my work to help them figure out how to operationalize humble leadership. That is really what you're saying, and it means they have to stand in, gee, I don't really know exactly how to do this, and they have to engage their people in not knowing and discovering it together, and it's around certain behaviors and mindsets, and it is very, very big work, but it's the work that we all must be up to. Yes. I want to add a footnote to that, <coughs> and why, why organization development consultants are needed in that process. I think I've seen too many situations where you go to the top of the organization and you ask, do your subordinates tell you the truth? And the boss says, absolutely. We have a completely open relationship. And then you do a focus group with the subordinates and they say, certainly not. We certainly don't tell them the truth, but we make them believe that we do because it's really not safe. So the reason you need the outside OD consultant is to get at the reality uh, and looking at whether the people down in the organization really do feel it's a safe environment to speak up. Failure to speak up, as you know well from your safety work, is the biggest problem. And the boss is the last to discover that. That's great, yeah, thank you very much. I understand that people gain more respect the more they're willing to stand and take on the fire that can come at them from their people. And that is leadership in many cases, being told the truth, various levels of the truth. So um, final question, and then we might see if anybody here, we have time for one or two actual questions from the room, please. Your final question is the one about the OD approaches whether it'll change with significant technology developments like artificial intelligence and robots at work. 
uh, I'll have to quote Peter here because <clears throat> this is something that he's made me very aware of. <clears throat> the most interesting aspect of artificial intelligence that struck me is his point that the artificial intelligence is making everyone more intelligent because information is so much more easily available. So that in principle, the boss who thinks that I have information that gives me power may not really recognize that her subordinate can access that same information. We see this in, in medicine. Doctors who are confronted by their patients who have developed detailed knowledge of the disease that the doctor is supposed to be treating. So that means information no longer is a source of power. Information in the sense of something that we can acquire uh, in the internet that's sitting in the cloud is now a common commodity. And that will change the whole relationship of on what basis do people feel they have power. It'll be much more better ideas, uh, better ability to communicate, uh, better ability to ask questions, to elicit from the group what is available. So I think my take on this is that the, the robots at work are just extensions of our intelligence. And the future, as, as I think Peter would describe it, is it's robots are intelligence enhancers, not, not something that will make uh, us less intelligent or will take jobs away. It will just change the nature of the work. Uh, now, I'm not all that articulate about it, but I think it's, it's very important that we recognize in a fully interconnected world how information and intelligence becomes much more widely distributed and the new generations, therefore, are not going to look at experts as something special because they know that you can become an expert very quickly by just going into uh, all the vehicles that are available for gathering information, knowledge, uh, theories, uh, and whatever it is you need. Does that make sense? Does that make sense, everyone? Does that make sense? Maybe I'll start here. We, we have some nods in the room. Yes, it does make sense. And so, Ed, if our power does not come from position or information, but rather from our emotional intelligence and our social intelligence, is this part of what you're speaking to and that there's a set of competencies that will never go out of style even when AI comes in to dominate our economies? I think I, I very much believe that it is going to be a, a skill of being able to read the room, to see what's going on, to know how to ask questions. I don't like the word emotional intelligence because it covers just about everything. It's way, way too general a term. I think ability to manage relationships, uh, a more sociological concept, uh, ability to manage group dynamics, ability to help a group be in better communication, make better decisions. Uh, I like it to be more concrete than a vague term like emotional or social intelligence. I think a lot of it has to do with the literally, uh, literal ability to handle groups in all their varied forms. I'm very concerned, and we made this point in, in the Humble Leadership book, that the most important learning probably that is missing for most managers and most leaders in positions today is they don't know how to run meetings and they don't know how to run groups. They've never been taught. There are no workshops on group dynamics. 
there are no workshops on how to run an effective meeting. Uh, at least in the U.S., we just have all these negative images of meetings or a nuisance. Committees are no good. They, they just diffuse accountability. All of that is going to have to go away because it's going to be as General McChrystal in his latest book on how the U.S. military is changing. The title of the book is Team of Teams. Team of Teams. Not a boss running a team or developing a team, but teams coordinating with each other. And leadership will be distributed in those teams, and there will be coordinating roles, and there will be all kinds of evolutions of new roles. But it's going to be, in my view, all about groups rather than individuals and individual heroes. Excellent. Thank you so much. Please, one or two people, if you could, please come up and take the microphone and let Ed see your face here in the screen. And please ask a question on behalf of all of us. Um, when one person asks a question, oftentimes many of us have this question. So please, who's willing? Please come on up. Agus, right? Agus? Okay. Uh, very simple question, actually, uh, with the digital era that, you know, everybody now is more happy with the, their mobile phone, their gadget. But at the same time, uh, my assessment was people now more uh, interest to interact with the gadget instead of meeting personally. At the same time, so we as a leader, I believe that we need to talk to the person and to you know understand what is the need, and also at the same time share of our vision and also or what to do in the future. So, how do you deal with this? Thank you. Uh, let let me see if I really understood the question. <coughs> If, if I understood it, you're saying the people who report to you expect you to know answers and want you to be powerful. Is that right? It's not really that one. Actually, that people know is more uh, familiar. Can I borrow the handphone? Uh, using the gadget, right? So the interaction actually has become less. Oh, so I see. I, All right. right. Your concept yes. is level two mean that you need to talk to the person. That's my uh, question. <coughs> I think that the, the media are going to create a whole new form of level one and level two. I think it will. we will see that there are individuals and groups who, who talk to each other in very formal role terms. A lot of what you see in diplomacy, they, they may be using the media and they be using emails or whatever, but it's still very formal talk. But when I see my grandchildren and the younger generations using these same tools, they are beginning to develop ways of talking to each other that I think begin to qualify as level two. And they're using tricks. They're using certain kinds of words and certain kinds of symbols to indicate that they want more closeness and more intimacy and want to get to know each other better. I think this is evolving and I think it's inevitable because people will want to be able to differentiate whom can I trust and whom can I not trust. And they will develop ways of doing that, uh, even in, in the situation where they never see each other. I do have some consulting clients around the world 
whom I have never met, but we have evolved a level of trust with each other through tone of voice and maybe some, some video. So I think it's possible to develop level two relationships without being co-located. Okay, thank you. Did that get out of there? Yeah. Hi, Dr. Eric. Thank you for your uh, reciting about humble relationship, relationship today. I just only have a simple question for you. Is this that have a third level or just only the second level? I, I'm sorry, I'm not understanding you. It is that the humble relationship having a third level or just only end by the second level? That's much a difference between third level. Yeah, is, is, is there a third level oh, 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 in okay. humble leadership? Yeah. Yes. In I should mention <clears throat> a lot of the answers to that question and also some of the other questions are in in the book called Humble Consulting, where we distinguish the four levels: the minus one, one is the transactional two is the more personal, and three we're calling intimate. The level three is when you are dealing with your family members, with very close friends, and in some work situations, the nature of the work, for example, in some of these military groups like the Navy SEALs, uh, they probably develop something close to level three relationships because it's so important that they know each other intimately in order to get the job done. But I think in most ordinary work situations, we not only don't need level three, but in many organizations, we consider it wrong or inappropriate to get too close to people so distinguishing level two from level three becomes an important issue in organizations. Thank you. Great, thank you. So um, Ed, we do have some interest here, so if you're okay to answer another question, that'd be great, thank you. Just so long as I understand the question, that's, that's the key. <laughs> Good morning, uh, Dr. Shine. Uh, I'm Rick uh, from Manila, the Philippines, and my question is, uh, when all this started in the 50s, it brought a lot of promise. What is your assessment in terms of OD performing or achieving this promise today? Or how relevant is organization development in today's world? Well, I'll, I'll give you my <laughs> my feeling level <clears throat> assessment. I think when OD started uh, back in the 60s and 70s, there were a number of very, very innovative companies, particularly the oil companies, uh, SO and, and others, who were deeply supportive of particularly the group work. There was something called the managerial grid that was widely adopted. And I think in the first, say, 20 years of organization development, it really took off. But what happened is that the companies recognized the importance of some of the OD principles, better communication, better relationships, and absorbed a lot of OD into the workings of the organization. So you found more and more organizations uh, developing OD departments. In my classes, I found more and more middle management students who had already had a lot of training in communication and relationships. So the question then of what else can OD do became the issue. And it turned out that when you get to the intergroup stage <clears throat> or developing the total organization, you had people like Peter Senge coming in with the learning organization. 
and you had other attempts. I think that's when the traditional managerial culture overrode some of the early efforts to do transformational work at the total system level. And that led to people like me and many others feeling like we are Sisyphus pushing a rock up a mountain. But the point is several people now are saying to us, the mountain, however, may be moving a little bit. With the internet, globalism, uh, multiculturalism, more and more traditional leaders and managers are beginning to look for new answers. So we see all these effectiveness programs, lean programs, Six Sigma, all that means there is a growing hunger for a new approach to developing the whole organization. <clears throat> and I think OD will therefore find a, a niche in that because I think OD does a better job than Six Sigma or Lean because it is more systemic and more learning oriented. So we still feel it's an uphill fight, but I think the, the tipping point may be closer to when suddenly companies will say, what we really need is not just the next version of the effectiveness program, which is all laid out, but we need the kind of openness and inquiry that the organization development consultant will bring to us that will enable us to do our own learning and our own improvement programs. So in that sense, I am hopeful. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shan. Thank you so much. And so I just want to check, uh, do a time check because we have our CEO um, summit or circle happening. What are we calling it? Yeah, the panel coming up. So uh, how are we on time, please? Is it time to, I'm, I'm so sorry for the, so <laughs> yeah, great. And so Ed, one of the things that you know I'm taking away is the vital role of the fact that we can't let the outer technology overrun the inner technology of our hearts. And that is a more and more rare skill that we seem to have. And it is genuinely a competency that's going to need to go well into the future. And it does require a humble heart to do that and as leaders to take that role truly of servant. So this is part of what I'm hearing from you. And um, with this friend, we thank you. And we thank your forehead because we're seeing your forehead. <laughs> We thank you so much for your gracious presence today and your wisdom. Thank you. It's a great opportunity to share some of these ideas uh, across the oceans <laughs> into new cultures because I think the world is becoming multicultural. Thank you. Anybody else feel some intimacy with Dr. Shine today? Did he create a level two relationship here? Okay, can you see the hands raised? We're so appreciative of you, Ed. Thank you so very much for being with us. And would everybody please just have a stand up and then we'll get ready for Dr. Ula and Rajesh and they'll come in and introduce the CEO panel. And so please stand up. Ed, thank you very much. Number one, thank you. nothing the less. Opportunity. Leave.